Hello everyone, this is Orlando from A Collector's Dream. And today I want to talk about, uh, I want to show you some cards of the 1888 Goodwin Champions. And I also want to talk a little bit about that set and how they were produced. So first of all, um, this is a, an example of, a, of the Goodwin Champions. And the Goodwin Champions set was uh, made in 1888. The 1888 Goodwin Champions consist of 50 cards. And by the way, it is my favorite set. It consists of, consists of 50 cards, each measuring one and a half by two and five eighths. Basically the same size as the T206 cards. They were inserted in packages of Old Judge and Gypsy Queen cigarettes. And the cards uh, really for the first time featured vivid full color artist rendering of the athlete against cloudy sky background with a white border. The player's last name, position, and team affiliation appear at the top of the card with Old Judge or Gypsy Queen printed within a box at the extreme bottom border. So these were produced in 1888. Um, and the ones I'm gonna show you today are gonna be the, uh, the set of the um, boxing cards. And uh, I, I saw an interview with uh, James, Elite Hunters, and John Mangini. And during that interview, they were talking about old boxing cards. So I really wanted to show you the oldest boxing cards that are out there, which are the Goodwin Champions. So a little more about the Goodwin Champions. They, um, they, there's 50 cards in the set, and there's actually 18 different sports that were represented. Uh, the set is dominated by the eight baseball players and anchored by the Hall of Fame players, uh, Cap Anson, Dan Brothers, Tim Keefe, and King Kelly. It also has the top boxers, which at the time was Jack Dempsey and John L. Sullivan. Those are the most valuable cards in the set, along with the Buffalo Bill and the Harry Beecher, because the Harry Beecher was uh, he was a captain of the Yale University uh, football team and is considered the first football card ever issued. And I actually did a video on that. Uh, my first video shows the, uh, the, the oldest football cards, including the Harry Beecher card. So a little bit more about how these cards were made and how these cards were printed. I'm gonna give you a real close up of this so you can kind of see as I, as I speak to it. The detail on these cards were truly, truly incredible. And these, believe it or not, were the first chrome cards, what they call chrome cards, because it was produced with chromolithography. Uh, and these were the initial chromolithography cards. And the technique involved to make these cards used multiple lithographic stones, one for each color. So every time they had to put a color or a shade, it was a different stone that was used. And most of these stones at the time, they they used. Um, uh, let me see if I could I could remember what it what it was. It's it's. Um, I'll, let me read off a little bit, and I'll tell you a little bit about it was. But they were they were actually limestone that was used that were sanded down. So it says the initial chromolithography technique, and I'm just going to say chromolitho because it's too long. Chromolithography technique involved the use of multiple stones, one for each color, which was extremely expensive when done for the best quality results. Depending on the number of colors present, a chromolitho could take up to, could take even very skilled workers months to produce. Remember, all these were handmade cards. So they had to carve the image on these stones. And the chromolitho process was one that transferred the ink from that stone onto paper. So, and chromolitho is a chemical process. The process is based on the rejection of water by grease. The image is applied to a stone, either gra grain or grained zinc, with a grease-based crayon or ink. Limestone and zinc are the two most commonly used materials in productions of chromolitho. Uh, now, you know, the beginning, they started using aluminum. Uh, but in the old days, it was basically stone. After the image is drawn onto one of these surfaces, the image is gummed up with a gum arabic solution and weak nitric acid to desensitize the surface. Before printing, the image is proved before finally inking up the image 
with the oil-based transfer or printing ink. Uh, so in a direct form of printing, the ink image is transferred under pressure onto a sheet of paper using a flatbed press. So they'd have to put the paper and they'd have to press it in there to, to get the different colors. And the key on this was accurate registration. So for that, they used multicolor work was achieved by using a key outline image and registration bars, which are applied to each stone or plate before drawing the solid or tone image. So they were very, very difficult to make because essentially they had to put one color on, then another color on top of that using the different stones. So each sheet of paper will therefore pass through the printing process as many times as there are colors in the final print. So in order for each color to be placed in the right position, each stone or plate must be precisely registered or lined up on the paper uh, using a specific, uh, using a system of register marks. I wanna see if I can show you, this is what the stones look like back in those days. This is an example of a stone, of a limestone. You see it's a limestone piece and that's what they looked like when they printed them. This was an actual printing uh, stone from the 1800s. So I'll give you a quick look at something what that stone would look like. So these were very, very difficult to, to make uh, because of that process. So what I wanna do is now that I've talked a little bit about uh, the process of printing, um, just kind of show you a little bit of the cards here. Let me back up a little bit here. This is the, um, the Goodwin Champion. This is the beach card and these are the, this is, he's a rower. Now this card, the reason I picked this card is because it's literally a mink card, except it's graded good too. And the reason it's graded good too is because it was stuck on an album and you can see the glue. And PSA usually, once they see the glue in the background, they will, they will lower that. But this card is just in really perfect condition almost, you know, a little bit corny compared to, you know, from you're talking a card that from 1888. So you can see my range of my collection. I think my last video was from the 1980s. So now I'm gonna show you uh, cards from the 1880s. So I'm gonna move on a little bit and, and start to, to show you some of these players and talk a little bit about these boxers. But before I do that, you can see underneath this, I have this. And this is the PSA SMR, which is their magazine back from June of 2017. The reason I'm showing you this magazine, and I haven't opened it because I have opened a few others. I couldn't find the one that I had opened because this has the story of the 1888 Goodwin Champions. And um, I was actually interviewed. Uh, it, my interview is in this magazine. So if you wanna pull that up, you can do that. It's also on the PSA website. And one day I'll go through the magazine, I'll show you the interview, but uh, I was interviewed by PSA um, on the 1888 Goodwin Champion set. Uh, at the time I was uh, one of the top in the registry and today I am number one in the registry. So just to show you, this is what the backs look like here. And the backs have all of the players in there. This is my, uh, one of my boxers and this is my lowest graded boxer, which is Jem Smith. So I want to talk a little bit about Jim Smith because, you know, I'm, I'm really into the history and that's one of the reasons that I really got into these cards. Um, I just love, love the history. So a little bit about Jim Smith and Jim Smith was born in 1863 and he was a bare knuckle prize fighter and he was a heavyweight champion of England in the, in the late 19th century and, you know, in the 1880s, 1890s. Uh, and he was inducted into the uh, Bare Knuckle Boxing Hall of Fame. These sets, again, this is a Goodwin champion, so they put all the champions. Uh, Smith was not one of the best uh, boxers in those days. He did start boxing at the age of 18, 
1889, he won the last internationally recognized bare knuckles prize fight. Uh, Smith fought in his first heavyweight title in 1884 uh, in England. And over in England, he became the champion. And um, when he came to this country, uh, say from England, 1887, in defense of his title, he fought Jake Kilrain. And Jake Kilrain, uh, I'll show you his card too. Jake Kilrain was one of the, also one of the champions during that time. And there is Jake Kilrain. So I'm gonna kinda, I'm gonna move these other guys to the side here so I can focus you on, on the two guys I wanna talk about first. Um, so that match between Jem Smith and Jake Kilrain, um, in defense of the heavyweight title at that time, lasted two hours and 16 minutes. They fought for 106 rounds. Remember, in those days, they just fought until somebody was just knocked out or killed. You know, unfortunately, that's the way it was. These are the bare knuckle fights. The, 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 basically, it's, it's like the MMA, the early MMA uh, fighting. Uh, so after 106 rounds, the bout was called a draw due to darkness. Uh, and then you know, he continued on with his fighting, but he really wasn't one of the best boxers. And uh, his record here, as far as it's very tough to get some of these. Uh, I'm going to move this out so you can get a better look at the background on that. So, you know, in, in those days, they didn't keep a lot of records as far as official records. So, so really, Jem Smith, technically, he only had 14 fights. Even though he's, he fought, you know, they say over 100 fights, in, his, in, in the record, for the boxing record, it, it only shows him uh, having a, a nine, and, 9 and 5 record. He won 9 and lost 5 in one draw. So that's his, um, a little bit about uh, Jem Smith. And um, let me uh, see if I can give you a little more information on Jeff Smith real quick here. Um, so I'm actually going to go ahead and go on to the next one. Because Jeff Smith was, in a, and it is my lowest graded. I do want to say, as you watch my videos, if anybody has a higher graded Jeff Smith than A3, I'm interested. Let me know. I've got a lot to trade. And, and I'm or cash whatever you want. That's one of the ones I need to upgrade for my set. So that's the Jem Smith. Now I'm going to talk about Jake Kilrain. And uh, I'll leave Jem Smith in there since they're kind of associated since they did fight together. So Jake Kilrain, um, uh, Jake Kilrain uh, was born John Joseph Killian. Uh, he was a feared bare knuckle boxer in the late 19th century. He took on the name Jake Kilrain to hide his boxing career from his parents. He learned to fight to defend himself against fellow workers in East Coast rolling mills. He soon developed a reputation for being able to withstand nearly any punishment that any opponent could throw his way. He became a professional in 1883 and Kilrain fought all of the big guys. He fought uh, the likes of Mike Clary, George Godfrey, and Charlie Mitchell, Willem Sheriff, and many others. In 1887, he participated in that epic battle, the two and a half hour, 106 round contest again, against Jem Smith. And um, these bouts were a mere preparation for the most famous fight of Kilrain's career, which was an 1889 challenge of John L. Sullivan in what was the last World Heavyweight Championship fight decided with bare knuckles under the, um, what they call in those days, the London prize ring rules. And that was the bare knuckles fight. And uh, I'll talk more about Kilrain and Sullivan's battle when I get to the Sullivan card. But briefly, Killian, Kilrain battled Sullivan for more than two hours in the heat that, ex that exceeded 100 degrees. In the 76th round, can you imagine in the 76th round, the Jake's Kilrain's corner, they, they finally told him that he had to give up. Um, in, in the 76th round, the quarter declared defeat. 
purposely out of the fear that Sullivan was on the verge of killing Jake. Several years later, the fighters would become friends with Kilrain serving as a pallbearer of uh, the funeral for, um, for, for uh, John L. Sullivan. Um, a little bit more about Jake Kilrain. Uh, you know, he had a, a, a tremendous record. I mean, he, again, these don't show, you know, you, you, Back in those days, in the 1880s, a lot of these fights were bars or places where they really didn't keep many records, but he had 47 total fights and he won 31 and lost five. So he was one of the top players at that time. And, um, you know, he had many, many, many fights. Uh, he was also an Englishman and, uh, you know, in, in later in his career, uh, him and Sullivan became very, very close friends, you know, after Sullivan kind of beat him up. Uh, and Kilrain continued fighting after the Sullivan fight for, for over 10 years after that, but he fought uh, with gloves because after that they started fighting with gloves, what was called the Marquis de Queensberry rules. And those were, were very, very lightweight gloves. I mean, they barely were gloves but they had a little bit of padding. You know, his most significant win was a 44-round knockout of George Godfrey in 1891. And, um, you know, he, again, was, was a great player, and it says in, in later life, Kilrain became good friends with John L. Sullivan. So there's Jem Smith, and there's Jake Kilrain. Can you imagine these guys fighting for 106 rounds? And Jake Kilrain fought 76 rounds with John L. Sullivan. I mean, that must have been incredible. So, and this is this one is in a grade five. I'll show you what the backs. The backs all look the same in these cards. They're all just have the uh, the checklist of all of the players. So, I'm gonna move these up here, and I'm gonna move on to the next boxer here. And the next boxer, and this one is in. The highest graded card and of of uh, of this guy and that's charlie mitchell a little scratch on the on the uh, case here so let's talk a little bit about charlie mitchell i'm gonna pull that up here so you can see a little bit about charlie mitchell so here's here's charlie mitchell uh again another one of these uh you know, great, great boxers back there. And Charlie Mitchell was a small guy. You know, he wasn't one of the big, big guys. He was only 5'9", and he never weighed more than 150 pounds. But he was a game fighter. And he was also born in England, and he was a boxer who packed a sharp punch, they said. He fought during the transition be be between the bare knuckle and the gloved eras. In 1883, Mitchell challenged John L. Sullivan and he actually uh, knocked down uh, John L. Sullivan in the first round before um, they, in, in those days, some of these fights were illegal. So he was one of the few people that actually knocked down John L. Sullivan in the first round before the police halted the contest in the third round. And um, uh, John L. Sullivan actually ended up beating him because they later fought again. Uh, he says, uh, and he also fought some of the big, big name guys after, including uh, Jim Corbett and Jim Smith, Jim, uh, J. J. Kilrain and all that. So he did fight. All these guys kind of fought each other. You know, they were really, really uh, uh, good, good boxers. And um, so a little bit more about, uh, about Mitchell. Let me show you a little bit more of the card there. I guess I'll put in this so you can get a little bit of a view, but a little bit more about uh, about Charlie Mitchell. Uh, and um, in 1882, there was a guy named Billy Madden, and Billy Madden wanted to find someone that could actually uh, challenge John L. Sullivan. So in order to find a challenger for John L. Sullivan, uh, they had they held a professional tournament, and the tournament included. Uh, you know, everybody that wanted to, to fight, all of the boxers in those days. 
but they consisted of three three-minute rounds with an extra two-minute round being fought in case of the draws. So there was a number of prominent boxers, including Jem Good and Jack Nif Nif Nifton and, and many, many others. But despite being the youngest and the lightest of the 21 competitors, Mitchell, Charlie Mitchell, won that tournament. So he had the opportunity to go fight with John L. Sullivan. So Mitchell came from Birmingham, England and fought John L. Sullivan in 1883. And he knocked him down in the first round. And again, that fight was, was actually stopped. Uh, the cops, the police stopped it. In their second meeting, and that took place in 1888 on the grounds of the Chateau at, at Chantilly, France, in a driving rain, it, this fight went on for more than two hours. Incredible. I mean, can, if you could imagine these guys fighting. So after two hours, uh, it says here that um, that um, after two, more than two hours, at the end of which both men were unrecognizable and had suffered much loss of blood, neither could lift his arms to punch, and the contest was considered a draw. Um, and then after that, they actually arrested Mitchell because, you know, those fights were, were illegal in those times. This is boxing became illegal in France at that time. But Sullivan managed to evade the, the, the law uh, it says, swathed in bandages, he was taken across the English Channel to spend the next few weeks in Liverpool. And after that, again, they became friends. And Mitchell acted as Sullivan's corner man for many years after that. In 1884, Charlie Mitchell fought uh, his most noteworthy bout, other than the one with, uh, uh, with Sullivan, against James Corbett for the heavyweight championship of the world. That was in 1894. And Corbett won by a knockout. And um, Corbett won $20,000. He ended up knocking out Charlie Mitchell. But if you can imagine this guy, I mean, it was almost like a, you know, he was kind of like a, I guess, Muhammad Ali type because he was a small boxer, but he was quick and he was able to move around and, and punch and punch and punch and punch and, Eventually, you know, um, you know, uh, Sullivan got up to him, but but another great, great boxer from eighteen from the eighteen hundreds. Uh, if you haven't heard of Charlie Mitchell, he was an incredible boxer. And here's Charlie Mitchell. There's the back of the card for Charlie Mitchell, and this is the highest graded card uh, of Charlie Mitchell, graded in year mint mint eight. So now we're going to move on to some of the big boys in the set here which are the two biggest names. I'm gonna move this over here. And the two biggest names, the two biggest boxing cards in this set is the Jack Dempsey and the John L. Sullivan. And this is the highest graded Jack Dempsey card in existence. This is graded a seven and a half. Again, 1888 Goodwin Champion. And I'll show you the back of it. That's what they look like. Just again, it just uh, has the checklist. They all look the same in the back. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Jack Dempsey. And, and now there were there there are actually two Jack Dempseys in the Hall of Fame, in the Boxing Hall of Fame. First, you know, the one most people know was Jack Dempsey. Uh, you know, back in the you know the 30s and stuff like that, and uh, he was called the, the, the Manasseh Mahler. And that was, uh, you know, that he was not the original Dan Jack Dempsey. And people don't realize who this Jack Dempsey was, but this Jack Dempsey, like it says, and I will read a little bit from the Boxing Hall of Fame. Uh, now largely overshadowed by his namesake, the heavyweight champion Jack Dempsey, the original Jack Dempsey, was a boxer of enormous talent. At the peak of his career, he was the best around. Now, this Jack Dempsey was a middleweight fighter, and he was the middleweight champion of the world. You know, he wasn't in the heavyweight division like the uh, like John L. Sullivan was. I'll move this down here. So, um, 
So a little bit more about Jack Dempsey. Dempsey was unbeaten in his first 14 fights. In 1884, he earned a chance to battle George Fujiyami, and who had recently claimed the middleweight championship. Dempsey knocked out Fujiyami out in the 22nd round to become the, uh, the American or the world middleweight champion. Uh, Dempsey went on fighting in, in, most, in, in both coasts. You know, he went from uh, all the way out to San Francisco. He remained undefeated until 1889 when he fought George LeBlanc in San Francisco. In the first encounter three years later, Dempsey had knocked LeBlanc out in 13 rounds. Uh, but this time they battled for 32 rounds, with Dempsey getting the better of LeBlanc when the challenger executed a pivot, a pivot punch which dropped Dempsey in his tracks. Now that pivot punch was an illegal punch. It was basically hitting somebody with their elbow in the back of their hand, both. It says the pivot punch was thrown using a backhand motion so that the uh, puncher's elbow, forearm, or fist would connect with the victim's head. And that move was declared illegal. So even though he got knocked out, Dempsey, uh, even though he got knocked out, he was permitted to retain his title because of that illegal punch. And after that, that punch was completely, uh, you know, was, was illegal. It was illegal to begin with. And Jack Dempsey, his nickname was um, the non pareil And the non pareil the meaning of that is without equal. So his nickname basically was without equal. No one was as good as him. He became the undisputed middleweight champion with his victory over Billy McCarthy in 1891. Uh, he also beat up Bob, Fitt, Bob Fitzsimmons uh, and many, many other boxers. And his, his boxing record is extremely, extremely impressive. Um, uh, Jack Dempsey, won a total of 50 fights and lost only three. So he was 50 and three with eight draws. And he was inducted in, and of course he's in the uh, Boxing Hall of Fame. Um, a little bit more about him. He said that um, he, was, he was the type of person that he, he always was saying a champion never quits. And even though he went down for a knockout one time, he tried to get up and he wanted to continue to fight. This guy never, never quit. And he was the first middleweight champion of the world. The first middleweight champion of the world. Um, so that is uh, Jack Dempsey, a record of 50 and three. An incredible boxer back in those days and the first middleweight champion of the world. So that's Jack Dempsey from 1888. If you can look at those cards with the colors and all of that, it's impressive and incredible how they actually printed these cards. And I talked to you a little bit about they, how they did that, but it was so detailed. I mean, you could see the, their muscles and things there and how these things were printed. Every color had to be put on separately. So Jack Dempsey, this is one of the um, top five cards from this 1888 Goodwin champion. And he was the top middleweight, the other first middleweight champion of the world. So now we're gonna move on to the most impressive boxer probably in the history of boxing. And this is the back of the card. I'm gonna show you the front of the card and this is Mr. John L. Sullivan, and I'll call him Mr. This one's graded in a seven. The highest graded example of the John L. Sullivan is an eight. So I wanna show you a good look at the, the card of John L. Sullivan. This one has a small print defects in the bottom there, but again, that's the way they were printed. They were hand printed in those days, so this is this is really one of the key cards to the set, John L. Sullivan. And why is it one of the key cards? Well, let me tell you about John L. Sullivan. Um, John L. Sullivan was called the uh, Boston Strong Boy. And, you know, he was an Irish immigrant uh, born in 1858. 
and he was about 5'10", weighed about 190 pounds. Uh, he was also, he was one of the top athletes at the time. Uh, Sullivan played semi-pro uh, baseball in the Boston area. And actually, they, uh, the Cincinnati Red Stockings offered him a contract, signed him for a contract, but he ended up declining and went to, uh, went to boxing. He was better at boxing, he made more money at boxing. From an early age, Sullivan showed great proficiency with his fists. As a teenager, he would fight in the Boston ballrooms. They said that over his career, he fought over 450 fights. And there's no records of all of those because a lot of them were in bars and all of that stuff. It says in, um, in 1878, he knocked out Cocky Woods in Boston in his first pro debut. In 1880, he boxed ex exhibition fights. And he just fought and fought and fought and fought. And the, the, the thing with him is, he was one of these guys that uh, he would take on all comers. He would fight everybody that wanted to fight him. Uh, no matter who it was, uh, or, or how big or how small, whatever. You know, he was one of the world's highest paid athletes in the era. You know, he was very, very famous uh, for being, you know, the, the guy that just would, would take on anybody. Um, it says, as a professional, Sullivan was nicknamed the Boston Strong Boy. As a youth, he was arrested several times for participating in bouts where the sport was outlawed. He went on exhibition tours, offering people money to fight him. Uh, Sullivan won more than 450 fights in his career. Um, there is some controversy, you know, and things like that around him because there were not many records on him. But, um, you know, he went from coast to coast by train with five other boxers and they scheduled fights uh, all over the place. To promote the tour, Sullivan announced that he would box anyone at any time during the tour under the Queensbury rules for $250. He knocked out 11 men during that tour. Nobody beat him. Um, in Sullivan's era, there were no formal, um, uh, you know, belts given in those days. Let me see if I can put a little bit more cards in there. So you can watch some cards as I talk about it. These are the two main boxers back in the day. So um, there were no awards given there. There was no uh, belt or heavyweight championships in those days, you know, and he became the first heavyweight champion and they actually uh, created a belt for him. It says, when the modern authorities write of the heavyweight champion of the world, they're likely referring to the championship belt presented to Sullivan in Boston in 1887. The belt was inscribed presented to the champion of champions, John L. Sullivan, by the citizens of the United States of America. Its centerpiece featured flags of the US, Ireland, United Kingdom, other countries and if you could look carefully there's the belt right there so I'll give you a good look that is the belt that was given to John L Sullivan and that is the first heavyweight championship belt ever given to any boxer in history he was the first true champion with the true championship belt you know, I love history and that's why I love these cars. That's why I love to talk about this. And that's why uh, I was attracted to this uh, 1888 set because it has the top, uh, you know, uh, people in here, uh, top athletes, I mean. So uh, a little bit more about John L. Sullivan. Talk to you about the fight with Jake Kilrain. Let's get Jake Kilrain back in the picture here. This was what was the fight of the century back in those days. Look at the ring, how it was. It's just a, a string with some poles there. And they would just fight. And it wasn't leaning on rings there. They would come, come at each other. It, it wasn't, you know, uh, let's box around a little bit. These guys went right at each other. And it says, the, K the kill rain fight is considered to be a turning point in boxing history. 
It was the last world title bout under the London prize rings. Basically, it was the last ever bare knuckle heavyweight title bout. For the first time, newspapers carried extensive pre-fight coverage, which included the reporting on the fighter's training and speculating on where the bout would take place. The traditional center of bare knuckle fighting was New Orleans, but the governor of Louisiana had forbidden the fight in their state. Sullivan had trained for months uh, in New York under trainer Will Mo Will Muldoon, William Muldoon. William Muldoon is also in this 1888 set, and I should have shown you his card. I'll show it to you when I pull out the wrestlers. He was a, a champion wrestler at the time, but he became uh, John L. Sullivan's trainer, especially to get him in shape. The problem with John L. Sullivan is that he was like a Babe Ruth, a drinker, he ate, he got out of shape. So, um, you know, he, uh, you know, he had, he, had to be, he, he had to get him in shape. And the only one who could do that was William Muldoon. So William Muldoon became his trainer. And um, uh, so it said that William Muldoon, whose biggest problem had been keeping Sullivan from liquor, a report on Sullivan's training regimen was written by famed reporter Nellie Bly and published in the New York World. Uh, it said, on July 8, 1889, an estimated 3,000 spectators boarded special trains for a secret location which turned out to be uh, in Richburg, a town just south of the Hattiesburg, Mississippi. The fight began at 1030, and it first looked like Sullivan was going to lose, especially after he vomited during the 44th round. Can you imagine that? The 44th round and he, he vomited. Why? Because the night before they said that he had been drinking and eating and partying the night before. So here he was vomiting in the 44th round. However, Sullivan, the champion, got his second win and was able to turn things around for himself. After a grueling beatdown, Kilrain's manager finally threw in the towel of, after the 75th round. They thought that John L. Sullivan was going to kill John Kilrain. He was hurt that badly. So, um, you know, he undefeated. He went undefeated in his career. Um, he actually ended up losing one fight during his entire career. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about that fight now. And that fight was after he became old. Um, so, uh, you know, after the, the, that fight, it says, uh, undefeated at that point, Sullivan did not defend his title for the next three years. During that period, uh, you know, he became, uh, you know, out of shape, he, he gained weight, uh, and then, you know, he didn't defend his title. So, but Sullivan finally did agree in 1892 uh, to defend his title against gentleman Jim Corbett. And this one was on September 7th, 1892. Now, times had changed by then, so that uh, the bare knuckles was totally outlawed. So during that fight, they, he had to wear gloves. Now, John L. Sullivan had fought with gloves earlier in other bouts in, in states where they didn't allow the bare knuckles, but he really preferred the bare knuckle. And once he got older, back in 1892, uh, he had to fight with gloves. So it said the heavyweight contest uh, against uh, Jim Corbett, uh, first of all, there were over 10,000 people uh, in, in capacity there, which was huge in those days. And the ticket prices were hefty ticket prices. They ranged anywhere back in those days from five to $15 and today's prices uh, well, I guess in close to today's prices, they estimate that it would have been a minimum $200 to $500 per ticket. But Corbett, who was younger and faster, and his boxing technique enabled him to dodge Sullivan's crouch and rush style. And in the 21st round, so he was more of a, Corbett was a little more of a Muhammad Ali style boxer with the padded gloves. Uh, so, um, it said in the 21st round, Corbett landed a smashing left that put Sullivan down, and Sullivan was counted out. 
Corbett was then declared the new champion. When Sullivan was able to get back on his feet, he announced to the crowd that if I had to get licked, I'm glad I was licked by an American. So Sullivan was considered the last bare knuckle champion because no champion after him fought bare knuckles. And in those days, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, he, you know, with the padded gloves and him being already, uh, you know, older, uh, it was his only fight that he was defeated. But other than that, you can imagine John L. Sullivan fought over 450 fights in his career and only lost his last one. And that was past his prime in 1892. So here is a good look at the John L. Sullivan card in a near men seven. There he is, the greatest boxer, what many consider the greatest boxer of all time and the first heavyweight champion with his heavyweight championship belt, the first heavyweight championship belt ever. So here is John L. Sullivan, the greatest boxer. Here's Jack Dempsey, the greatest and the first middleweight champion of the world. Again, uh, only with a 50 and three record. And John L. Sullivan, um, you know, it doesn't really have much of his record because many of those fights were not, um, you know, were not tracked. And here's another one of the great J. Kilrain, Charlie Mitchell, another great boxer during those days. All of these guys are in the Boxing Hall of Fame, except for Jem Smith. I don't think Jim Smith is in the Boxing Hall of Fame. He was the English champion that ended up losing. So I wanted to show you some of these cards from the 1888 Goodwin Champion set. Talk to you a little bit about how these cards were printed and a little bit about the boxers. And there are five boxers in that set with almost all of them being in the Hall of Fame. So anyway, guys, I want to give you a quick look at that. I'll be showing you a few more of my uh, Goodwin champions in the future, but I wanted to give you a good look at the five boxers from the Goodwin champion set. Thanks everyone for watching my videos. Please like and subscribe. And again, everyone have an awesome, awesome day. Thank you.